evening, everyone. My name is Deborah Scannell. I'm the director of the Forks campus of Peninsula College. And on behalf of the Associated Student Council and the League of Women Voters of Clown County, I'd like to welcome you to this candidate forum tonight. The college has a mission to educate, enrich, and promote the discourse of dialogue and diverse ideas. And so this collaboration with the League aligns perfectly with our mission. Many thanks to the League for their invitation to co-host this event, and especially to its volunteers for all the work they put into planning and organization. For those of you who aren't familiar with the programs at Peninsula College that are available right here, we have a, a combination of day and evening classes that make it possible to earn a transfer degree, GED certificate, adult high school diploma without leaving Forks. We also offer an applied science degree in early childhood education, and we have classes in basic computer skills and English as a second language. High school juniors and seniors can earn tuition-free college credits through our Running Start program, while at the other end of the spectrum, adults over 60 years old have a tuition-free opportunity to audit most of our classes. And our students have access to state-of-the-art technology, academic support in our learning center, uh, placement testing and advising, and financial aid support services. We also feature free cultural events throughout the year, including Studium West lectures and presentations, film screenings, and more. So um, Peninsula College has a table by the door with more information about our programs and events, so please feel free to take something on the way out if you're interested. Our four candidates have also placed information about themselves for you to take away in front of our reception desk. Restrooms are located um, at the end of the two hallways to my right, and we also have drinking fountains at the end of the second hallway. And uh, I just want to apologize in advance. We do have a class in session over here, so um, there will be a little bit of light foot traffic as they're coming and going because there's no other way to exit the building. So now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Teresa Tetro, our moderator for this forum. Teresa is a member of the League of Women Voters of Clown County, but we probably know her better as the Knowles West End Library Manager, where she has worked for nearly 20 years. Please welcome Teresa. everyone, welcome and thank you for being here and thank you to Peninsula College Associated Student Council for allowing us to use this facility. I also want to thank the members of the League's Voter Services Committee for their efforts in organizing this event. As Deborah told you, I'm Teresa Tetro and I have in fact worked for the North Olympic Library System for actually a little over 20, 20 years and I will be moderating this evening um, a little bit about the League of Women Voters. It's a 98-year-old national nonpartisan political organization whose purpose is to encourage local citizens to register to vote, become well-informed voters, and participate in all level, levels of government. The League does not support or oppose candidates, factions, or political parties, and the views expressed here tonight are those of the candidates and not of the sponsors of this debate. The League, however, does act in support of, or in opposition to, selective governmental issues which its members have studied. You can find more information about the League on the membership table there in the lobby, or by going to our website at www.lwbcla.org. There is a separate table for candidate in information, and. Deborah pointed out that it's there by the reception desk, and the Peninsula College also has information about their programs as well. So for tonight, we will be following the agenda that you were given when you came in. If you don't have one, please raise your hand, and the league member will bring one to you. Is there anybody who needs an agenda? Okay. All 
right, so before we begin, let's take care of a few important matters. First thing, I'm going to ask everybody to please turn off your cell phones and any noise-making devices that you have, if you haven't done that already. Uh, Deborah pointed out where the restrooms are. I also wanted to say a word about video recording. So there's no non-league audio or video recording devices of any kind permitted during this forum unless you receive prior permission. The league is recording the forum and the video will be posted on the league's website. Ken Lambert is also here recording the forum on behalf of Forks Broadcasting and parts will be on the radio tomorrow and also on, online at the radio's website. Yeah. So our forum tonight will be in two parts. The first panel will feature the candidates for District Court 2 judges. The next panel will be the candidates for District 3 County Commissioner. Each panel will follow the same basic outline. That is, the candidates will make brief opening statements. Next, we'll take questions from the audience, and then the candidates will make their closing remarks. We hope you will be thinking of the questions you would like to ask the candidates as you listen to their opening statements. If you need a card to write on, hold up your hand and a league member will provide one. So to make the most of our time, I ask you to kindly refrain from applauding or making any other noises which in any way interrupt our speakers. I'll be sure to give you a chance at the end of each panel to give a round of applause to the candidates. League members wearing name tags are located around the room. Please signal to them if you need assistance. Our timers this evening are Laura Dubois and Judith Parker. They're here in the front row, and their job is to make sure we stay within the time limits that have been established for each segment of the forum. Your agenda pro provides the summary information on the responsibilities of each office that is being discussed tonight, and so therefore I will not take time to repeat what you have before you. Okay, so. Let's get ready for panel one here, and that is the candidates for district court to judge. The candidates for this position are Eric Rohr and John Black. Both candidates, in the order they filed for office, will be given up to two minutes for their opening remarks. We have asked the candidates to introduce themselves by covering the following information. Their qualifications for serving in office, why they are running for district court to judge, and what their goals are for the first year in this term of office. Candidates, please keep your eye on our timers so that you can gauge your response. And we'll begin with Eric Rohr. You have two minutes. All right, thank you. I want to thank Teresa, and I want to thank the League of Women Voters of Clown County and Peninsula College for having us out for this event. I think it's a good event for the candidates. I think it's a good event for the community as well. Um, I, I got warned yet. I've been in a jury trial all day. I'm probably a little more scattered than usual today, but uh, let me hit you with my qualifications. First of all, if you want to know everything, check out the brochure in the back. It's a clear, uh, honest description of how long I've done everything I've done as an attorney. But just a quick rundown. I, I became an attorney in my late 20s. I became the head of the office in Port Angeles. I opened the Attorney General's office in Port Angeles in my early 30s. Uh, in my early 40s, I took over from Susan Owens, now Justice Owens, I should say, uh, as the District Court 2 judge. I served it for 12 years as District Court judge. I went from that to the Superior Court, where I am currently. I'm now the presiding judge of the Superior Court, top judge in the county. Uh, I don't know, maybe Judge Doherty beats me, but I think I'm up there in terms of uh, the number of years I've done it. I want to get back to this position for a variety of reasons. Uh, but one thing, we live out here. My wife Carrie and I live out here, for real, not pretend. We actually live out here, and we love it out here. I want to spend more time out here for the same reason you folks are out here. Uh, I like being out here, and I would like to spend more time doing things here. Uh, I also think that I have some things to offer the court. I ran it well when I ran it, and I think I can do it again. Uh, it is a part-time thing, so it does free me up to do some things. I think I'm significantly more qualified than my opponent who has no judicial experience. So uh, those are the high points. Really, though, if you look at the brochure, I think it will tell you what you need to know. Um, so I'm asking all of you for your support in my bid for the District 2 position. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from John Black. 
everybody hear me okay? Yes, uh, I'm John Black. I'm an attorney here in Forks. I'm also an attorney in uh, Port Angeles. I've had an office here out on Spartan Way for the last 17 years, serving the uh, West End. Not just in court criminal cases, but uh, doing uh, family wills, family estate planning, and that sort of thing. I've also been married for 42 years. I think that's worth something. I learned real quick who the boss was around there, and it wasn't me. But I'll tell you, if I can get that black robe, I'll know who the boss is. I'll be the boss, and I'll be calling the balls and strikes. And there's, a, and there's a lot that needs to be done out here, and there's a lot of changes that need to be done in here. My goal is to um, modernize this court. You look back here, first of all, it's been my appointment the whole time. This is the first time that the community has had an opportunity to choose a candidate who's for judge. First time in 25 years. Um, it's just been, the torch has just been passed along from judge to judge to judge. The torch in some smoke-filled back room of the courthouse. It's, it's, it's worse out here because at least in Superior Courts you've got the Board of Governors overseeing these appointments. And so there's, uh, there's some accountability there. And speaking of accountability, that's what I want to bring to the court, is I want to bring accountability I want to modernize it. I want to add some programs, some, a DUI court, a mental health court, that sort of thing. I want to hold these people accountable. I mean, if you look at my brochure out there, I encourage you to get that. That's my granddaughter. She's five. She also knows who's boss, and it's not me at home. But they're finding needles in the playgrounds around here and everywhere, and that's what I want to address. That's my biggest goal here is to address the drugs and alcohol and which would incorporate all the theft. Thank you. All right, thank you, candidates. Next, we will take as many questions as possible from you, the audience. We'll ask you to please come to the microphone and state your name and specify whom your question is for. You will have 30 seconds to ask your question. Our timers will hold up a stop sign if you use that time up. A league member will hold the microphone for you. The candidates will ha have up to one minute to answer each question, so please consider the time limit when crafting your question. It may help you to stay within that 30-second time limit if you write your question out beforehand and then read it when it is your turn at the mic. If you do not wish to come to the microphone, give your written question to one of our members and it will be read aloud by a league member for you. So again, the candidates will be given up to one minute to answer each question. Both candidates will have an opportunity to respond to all questions, even those directed at a specific candidate. I will then give each candidate the opportunity to respond to or rebut their fellow candidates' answers, who will be given up to 30 seconds for a brief response or rebuttal, or if they wish, they may waive their chance to respond. I would expect there will be approximately 30 minutes for audience questions and candidate responses, but this is just an estimate. If we run out of time before you, we get to your question answered, we would encourage the candidates to remain after the forum so that you may speak with them directly. And as you are coming to the mic, which will be here on my right, and any time when we get started, you can go ahead and, and, and line up there. But I'm going to kick off the first part of the forum with the first question, and this is for both candidates. Okay, so for the, the first question I have for you, and since Mr. Rohr started uh, with the introduction, we'll have Mr. Black answer first on this one. And the question is, what is a feasible way for indigent felons to provide compensation to the victims of their crimes? Mr. Black? Well, when you say indigent felons, we're not going to be doing a lot of felony work out here. This is a district court, and we don't uh, have felony cases out here. That's for Superior Court in uh, Port Angeles. But as far as the indigent that come into district court, I mean, obviously, if they don't speak English, we're going to be helping them with that. I mean, we have to have, they have to be able to communicate. And I think we have to investigate whether or not they, what kind of money are they 
people to do? Can they afford an attorney? Can they uh, pay for fines? And can they pay for that sort of thing? I mean, that all has to be uh, addressed in the beginning before we do anything. But they won't be here for uh, felonies. They'll be here for gross misdemeanors and misdemeanors. Thank you. Uh, before we move to uh, Mr. Roar, Barb and you folks in the back, can you hear okay? Can you hear the candidates? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Your turn, Mr. Roar. You have one minute, please. Thank you. Same question. You know, I don't think there's any way, really, that victims can be made whole. Any of you that have ever been victimized know what I'm talking about. There's no amount of money, there's no words that you can say that's going to make you all better. I mean, I, I think the question is kind of uh, hard to answer, but uh, realistically, what we have is restitution. We can get even indigent people to produce some amount of money toward restitution, to pay back perhaps a victim for counseling, that type of thing. Uh, Short of that, uh, we have community service work. It doesn't really help the victim, but it's the best we've got. It helps repay back the community for the wrongs that were done. One of the things I would like to do, and one of the things I'm in active conversations with people in the community, is, is beefing up our community service program so it's more meaningful, more meaningful for us as citizens, more meaningful for the defendants. I think it's going to help. I think it's a little self-focused, but uh, I think there's a lot of trail work that would benefit some of the young people in the community. Just for example, uh, that kind of thing, it's a, you know, it's not going to make anybody whole, but it's the best we've got. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Black, you have 30 seconds for a rebuttal. Yeah, i I got to say, you know, community service work, I mean, that's fine and dandy, but, but that's been going on for 25 years. That isn't, that isn't something that's really taken off around here. We need to do some, we need to do more than community service work to hold these people accountable. I like community service work. But, you know, there's cases out there where we need to address the drug problem, the alcohol problem, the theft problem, all that mental health problem. Let's get to the root of it, not let's just go give them community service. I want to do a, some more programs in here, not just do the same old thing that's been going on here for 25 years. Thank you. All right, and Mr. Rohr, would you like to respond? 30 seconds rebuttal. Well, I think perhaps my opponent got the question mixed up. It's not a question of whether or not community service is good or community service is bad. It's what do we do with indigent people? How do they make the victim whole? I don't think we send them to drug treatment, I and mean, I don't think that's going to help. I don't know what crime he's talking about. Let's say it's a domestic violent assault. That's something he never talks about. That's what we do a lot of, domestic violence related work. It's not all drugs around here. So. Uh, I think we need to kind of expand or respond to the question, I guess. Okay, thank you. All right, so we have one more question coming from the league, and this time, Mr. Rohr, you will start. And the question is, how adequately is the current district court serving the needs of the public? Well, that does seem like a good question. I think that the public's being well served by the district court. For one thing, um, not only have I been a district court judge for 12 years, but also I've been to a lot of district and municipal court judges' uh, conferences, and I've talked to a lot of judges throughout the state. We're all doing a similar thing. We're not on our own here in Forks of our district court. I think it's serving the public well. I think it could be made better. I have some ideas for making it better, but I don't think it's going to be changing like night and day. Uh, we hear a lot about, we're going to change the court, we're going to modernize it or something, but what specifically are we talking about? What are we going to do that's different than what's currently being done? How is it different than what's being done in Port Angeles, for example, where they also have a district court? I mean, I don't know, we never hear that part. It's just this sort of 24-7, you know, justice for the West End, a bunch of sloganeering. Let's get real. We're not going to change the district court into something completely different than what it is. It's a district court. It's still going to be a district court at the end of the day. Thank you. Mr. Black, same question, please. Yeah. Well, I'm a can-do guy, not a can't-do guy. And that's what's been going on here for 25 years. Oh, we can't do this. We can't do this. We can do it. It's been DUI courts are in Port Angeles. They're all over the nation. The only place that we don't have one is here. And he talks about uh, domestic violence. Do you don't think these people, when they get in a big fight at home, that they're, that they're drunk or on drugs? or because that somebody spent all the money, the rent money on drugs? Of course it is. That's at the root of the problem here. And that's what I want to address, is the root of the problem, not just kind of go, well, it's just district court, we're just a part-time job. I'll tell you what I'm not. I'm not a politician. 
I'm not a bureaucrat. I'm a businessman, and businessmen get results. Results. If I don't get results, I can't pay my secretary. If I don't get results, you know, I'm not a bureaucrat. I don't just get a check every day just for showing up. So I want this job to make some changes to this court so it does, so it does serve the community, not just do the same old thing over and Thank over you. and over. Mr. Rohr, rebuttal. Yeah, I mean, one thing is, it's a little loose with the facts. Every court has it. There's a drug court everywhere. They're everywhere. I mean, I've got the printout from AOC. There's six, one, two, three, four, five, six total in the state of Washington. The one in Port Angeles has graduated, since it began in 2004, it's graduated 41 people. That's three graduates per year. At what cost? At what benefit? And I know what you're thinking, a DUI court. Yeah, let's hammer drunk drivers. That's not what it is. This is more like coddling drug drivers. I mean. Mr. Black, rebuttal. Well, I'm not sure we're uh, talking about facts, but uh, I'm a big part of the DUI court in Port Angeles under uh, Judge Porter. And we're graduating about 17 to 20. I think where Mr. Lohr may be going wrong is that on DUIs in particular, there's a five-year jurisdiction. So these cases don't get disposed of from the f until the five years. So it's easy to manipulate those facts. But that DUI court gives these people structure, and you can put drug people in there as well. And they're going to come and see me once a week, and I'm going to take a look at them, and if they don't pass mustard, then they're going to, there's going to be accountability and consequences. It's, it's very easy. It's not rocket science what we got lacking out here. Thank you. All right, is there anybody in the audience who would like to pose a question to the candidates? Um, go ahead and you can line up here along this uh, wall, wall to the south. So we'd ask you to state your name and then your question, please. My name is Bill Peach. My question to the candidates is please share your experience with this community, the Forks community. And I believe, Mr. Black, you're up first. Well, I, I, uh, I've had a lot of involvement with the community. Over the 17 years I've been out here, I've done a lot of estate planning for you folks, and some of you out here. And what really saddens me is when they come in and they don't, and they have to take some of their children out of the will because they're strung out on drugs or alcohol. And, they, and if were they to get a uh, benefit out of the, the gift from the will if their parents passed away, it would be a death sentence to them. That's pretty sad for me to see that sort of thing. Now, I don't know, um, I love this community. This is a very unique community. I started, you know, this year alone was the uh, scholarship auction. I donated five will packages. I was at the Harvest Dinner the other night, and that's a wonderful thing. Then the food was really good, too, and I brought my granddaughter as my date. I'm a community guy, I'm a family guy. And this community is very special. We did the, uh, we had a softball team at the West End uh, Co-Ed Softball Tournament. We had the Corn Huskers, or not the Corn Holers, or something. We had a tournament with that that I was in. And so I'm very much involved in the community. And, I, and frankly, I didn't see him at any of those events. Thank you. Same question, Mr. Wolf. All right, thank you. You know, I guess, you know, since he's going to make little jabs at me, I feel compelled to do the same. But, uh, yeah, what he is, he is a criminal defense attorney who lives in Squim. He works here and takes his money back there and spends it in Squim. He doesn't live here. I moved here with my wife back in 2001. The things I've done just outside of working, uh, just general work, I mean, I, there's a few different things I've done. I participated in the Chamber of Commerce, for example. I became a, mem a secretary. I was in the vice president. I became the president. I served two terms as the president of that group. In my capacity at the Chamber of Commerce, my wife and I developed a whole line of uh, Twilight-related products and sold them from our house online. We raised about 40 some thousand dollars within the first six months. I'm also, you know, we're here at Peninsula College. I'm on the board of trustees for Peninsula College. I'm the West End representative. You know, I, I was instrumental in the process of getting this facility built. This community is my community, and it means a lot to me. I want to get back to participating more fully in things here, like working on the trail, where we spend our last weekend working. Thank you. 30 seconds for a rebuttal. 
Well, I'm not sure where he, where he bases this incredible arrogance in, but uh, I'm sure there was one day that uh, Mr. Lohr was a fresh judge out here when he got appointed for the first time. So, you know, talking about yourself and how great you are is one thing, but that doesn't make you a member of the community. I'm a member of the community. Sure, I've lived in Squim for 17 years, but, but I've got a place out here now, and I plan on moving out here if I win this election. And I plan on bringing my wife out with me, and she's got 35 years of daycare preschool, which I understand is needed out here, too. So we're going to be a big asset to this community. Mr. Orr, 30 seconds for a rebuttal. Well, um, I guess I don't really, I'm kind of speechless after that, almost. Uh, no, I, I just don't think that that is, uh, is quite what the question calls for, really. So uh, I did want to add, though, that one thing I would like to do in addition to this is do some forwarding on the Olympic Discovery Trail. I think that the trail needs to get through all the way to Nia Bay. That's one of the things that, in my extra time out here, I would be willing to pursue. Uh, but it is true that I did start here one time. But I think it should be pointed out, I was 42 then. He's 67. It's one thing when you're at a certain point in your career and you're in your 40s and you're, when you're pushing 70. Thank you. Do we have some more questions? Sure. Oh, Mr. Sorry. The District 2 court runs, I guess this one is for um, John Black. The District 2 court runs consistently in the red. How do programs like those proposed by Mr. Black get funded, like drug court, uh, mental health court, 24-7 uh, supervision, DUI court, probation office, all of these things? How do they get funded? It's going to take a little bit of time. But as you know, um, this is a three-day-a-week job. On Wednesdays, it is trial day out here. And they never have trials out here. because. The, because these people are just continuously let off. There's no penalty, so there's nobody going to trial. I can do a DUI court just like Judge Porter does by myself with a clerk in this court on Wednesdays and have every of these people that I've got in there coming in and I can take a look at them and see what's going on. I'm in recovery myself. I know these people. They're my people. I look at them bumping down and I'll know I've got 25 years in recovery myself. Now all this stuff I could do, mental health court, I was in mental health court in uh, district court one the other day. All that involved was a uh, mental health treatment guy from uh, Peninsula Behavioral Health, he was there. These people come in and be checked out once a week. You look them up and down, you talk to Peninsula Behavioral Health, are they on their meds or not? It's very, uh, very simple and it's just involving more structure. Now this 24-7 program is also really good because it, I can get these, some of these people in twice a day to show that they're not drinking and once or twice a week to show that they're not using drugs. And that was given by grant to the county. Thank you. Mr. Rohr, same question. Thank you. Well, um, you know, he mentions Judge, Judge Porter repeatedly. Let me, let me tell you how this works. He lives in Squint, so he drives right by where Judge Porter works in Port Angeles on his way out here to Forks, where he says he's from now. But, uh, you know, he, Judge Porter, his, he's leaving his position. He endorsed somebody for the position. He didn't endorse my opponent. He endorsed Dave Newpert. Uh, Judge Porter, for some reason, doesn't think that, that my opponent is quite ready for prime time. He's good enough for Forks, I guess, but not good enough for Port Angeles. Uh, I, I just don't think that's a very good uh, commentary somehow. I just I can't believe that's where we're at. But um, as far as funding his, his ideas, I mean, the 24-7 program is a program of the sheriff's office, not the courts. The Oxford houses that he sometimes mentions, those are private businesses. Those are not run by the courts. We have a probation officer. I got that, you know, I had problems with the budget just keeping a probation officer. So I think budget issues are huge. Keeping the budget, keeping the court funded is almost impossible without his ideas. Thank you. Mr. Black, 30 seconds for a rebuttal. Well, I'm not sure where Mr. Gore is getting his information, but if uh, I want to look at my brochure, Judge Porter has endorsed me for uh, this position out here. Thinks I'd be the best guy for the job. And so did Jill Landis, the district court judge over in Jefferson County, has endorsed me, as well as two judges from the tribal courts, Elwha and the Macaw chief judges, have endorsed me for this job out here. So what that, I don't even know. But that's where it's at. I'm available to do this job. I'm, 
I will, I'm a worker. I'm not a quitter, by the way. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Roar, Well, you know, I, and I know these individuals he's talking about, and I don't think when they endorsed him, to be honest, they knew I was his opponent. Um, I've not talked to them because I don't really care because they're really not from the West End. None of those people live out here as far as I know. I'm, I'm doing this for the West End. Uh, it, it's a, it's a $75,000 per year pay cut for me. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't want to and if I didn't think it was important for our community. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Have some more questions from the audience? So, so Ed Bowen, in a completely different type of question, it's an idea question. I'm asking you for an idea. Uh, and it has to do with jury pools. I'm 58 miles one way from here in this district court. It's hard for me to remember if I have jury duty. All I get when I get the mailer is a little tab that has the date on it. And I've got to remember, and a lot of times I don't remember. As a manager of the court, could you do something about that to make potential jurors feel more involved and more invested and to be a part of the jury pool? Let's see, Mr. Rory, you're up first with this one. All right, well, I'm not quite sure how to answer you on that one. I think it's a good question. Maybe you should move closer to the courthouse. <laughs> Make it easier for you to get jury duty. <laughs> no, I, I, I am not sure. I mean, I think that's a problem for rural courts, really. I don't think that there's an easy solution to it. Um, I don't think there's any way we can really do court remotely, so that would be my first thought. You know, maybe some kind of video presentation, but it just doesn't work, I don't think, as well as live and in person. Uh, they got the same issue in Port Angeles. They got people coming from Diamond Point. I know it's not as far, but into town, and it, it's, a, it's a tough sell. Um, I, I, I've, I've tried to argue with jurors about it, kind of, and pointed out that a lot of them you know, are coming into town for other purposes. Maybe you could combine things, like for them going to Costco or something, but I don't think there's an easy answer as to how to make it better for people that live in almost 60 miles out of town, how to, how to Get, make it easier and better for them. Thank you. Mr. Black, same question. Well, once again, there's no easy answers from this side of the uh, table, but uh, there is a problem with getting juries. I mean, I'm a defense attorney, and I uh, try to take cases to trial, and I can't get a jury. I mean, they can only give me a jury like once a month or something because they have not made any effort to get a jury pool that would be happy to come in and be, do trials. If I'm elected judge, we're going to have a jury pool, and I'm going to figure out how to do it. I'm not going to just let it go. I'm a, I'm a businessman. I'm a can-do candidate here, not a, well, it hasn't worked in the past, so I, what are we going to do? So I don't see, uh, and getting back to uh, Judge Porter, he endorsed him when he quit here before, and now he's endorsing me, and he knows uh, Lowest running. I got a, he wanted me to put a sign right in his, in his yard to remind him every time he drives by. So for him to say that kind of thing is just silly. All right, Mr. Roar, 30 seconds for a little. All right, well, I, I guess I'll just go back to that one if that's what, what, my, what I wants to do. But I think he misunderstood. It's not that I guess I'm talking too fast or something, but really what uh, I was talking about is he didn't endorse him for the job in Port Angeles, not the one in Forks. Uh, it's the one in Port Angeles, the one he drives by. There's also an open superior court position he could have gone for. If he's such a hard-working businessman, can-do guy, he drove right past those places and came out to Forks. Think about it. What's his interest with this community, really? Mr. Black, rebuttal. I could have ran in uh, Port Angeles. I didn't want to. I wanted to run out here in Forks. And I'm also taking a heck of a pay cut by coming out here as well. And I, I, do, I do well in private practice, okay? So I want to come out here because I see a drug problem, and that's what I'm all about, is helping people get clean and sober and staying that way and having a program. I got uh, these courts here. I tried to get evals from West End, and they wouldn't give me evals. I subpoenaed them to bring me an eval to this court, and I didn't get any help from the court. So I had my friend, Gil Orr, move out here with Cedar Grove. He's been out here eight years. At least we can get emails Thank out you. here now. Thank you. Okay, another question from the audience. Hi, my name is Carol Oliva. Uh, this question is for John Black. Would you speak to the success rate of the drug courts you're involved in? 
For example, the graduates. What's the recidivism rate of the graduates? And also, with respect to programming, with the lack of services here on the West End, how would you propose that these programs operate with the gap in services? Okay. Thank you. Well, that's a good question because everybody wants to know how you're going to pay for these programs. And like I've said, on a D with a DUI court, it's just me. And I can do it on my time. I can do it on the court's time. I'm a working guy. I didn't come out here to retire. I came out here to work. So a DUI court or something like that is on a Wednesday because they never have trials. So they just sit in the court and, I don't know, play on the internet all day. Whereas I'm going to have a DUI court. I want to have a mental health court. And that's all with me doing it. I don't need to ask for money to do that. Now, the 24-7 the, uh, program is run by the sheriff. And I have talked to them. And it was my grant. It's so successful that you can get structure on these troubled people. And the recidivism rate is, when you have somebody with a structure for a year, the recidivism rate goes way down to under like 10%, whereas the what this current system with probation where you go see, you call them up once a month, hey, how you doing? Are you clean and sober? Oh, yeah. You know, that's, that's silliness. There's, there's nobody getting sober around here. Thank you. Clean and sober. Not really. Same question, Mr. Roy. All right. You, you know, really, the more I hear, I, I kind of feel like my opponent would be, would be better suited as a drug and alcohol counselor than as a judge. I mean, those are different rules. My focus is not on helping addicts and, and uh, drunks necessarily exclusively. My, my focus is more on helping victims of crimes. So I think that is a much bigger issue for the court. That's much more of what my focus is. That being said, I, I'm the one that runs the adult drug court in this county. I'm the one that runs the largest mental health calendar in this county. I know all about therapeutic courts and about how to fund them, et cetera. I don't see this one as working very well for that type of model. But what I do think, having done the court here 12 years, for 12 years, is that every single session was like a drug court to me. I took extra time to talk to each individual person. I, what I basically did is I put them at the end of the calendar if I felt they had, for example, a mental health issue or, or a communication issue of some type. And I spent extra time. I was up at the parade in Nia Bay and a guy came and said, you spent like an hour talking with me because I was deaf. So uh, that's how I do it. Thank you. Rebuttal, Mr. Black. Well, and that's, and that's really the, he's just brought up the biggest difference in him and me is that, you know, I've been out in the community. I've been doorbelling and talking to the community here for weeks. And I've covered almost all of Forks, and Clown Bay, and CQ. And you know what everybody tells me? Is that they want change. They want accountability. They want somebody in here that'll, that'll deal with the drugs and alcohol. Just the opposite of what he said. He's just going to do the same old thing that everybody has been doing for the last 25 years. They want to see some change. That's the community that I'm going to represent. Thank you. Rebuttal, Mr. Moore. Well, I, I don't know. When I, if you go around and talk to people, and I have too, they all say they want change. Nobody really likes the status quo, but I don't think they're talking about the Clallam County District Court 2 and 4. They're talking globally about the crime problem, the opioid crisis, uh, a number of things like that. I mean, I don't have solutions for everything, and if we're going to solve things, I doubt it's going to be at the District Court in 4, except that magnitude anyway. All we can do is, is try our best and use the tools that we are able to use, and that's what I intend to do. Thank you. Do we have more questions from the audience? I do. I do. There are drug issues everywhere. How will going to court make an addict recover or keep drugs off the street? Okay, and let's see, Mr. Black was first last time, so Mr. Rohr, you get to lead off. All right, well that's kind of what I was just talking about, really, to some extent. I mean, although we all think the drug problem is serious, and I, I, right in there, I mean, I, I work right next to the Salvation Army. Uh, I, I walk through there almost every day. I ride my bike through there on my way down to the waterfront. So I, I know we have a problem. But uh, it, once again, the opioid crisis is not going to be resolved at the district court level. This is the court where we handle DUI cases, domestic violence assaults, traffic tickets, shoplifting. There, there is little, if any opioid cases here or serious drug cases. Uh, 
my opponent oftentimes brings up what I call the empty baggie cases, where they try to get us to prosecute these sort of empty baggies that used to maybe have drugs in them, but they don't have enough to test them to see, and try to kind of bully people into treatment that way. I mean, I'm willing to go down that road a little bit, but that, that's not going to solve the drug crisis. Thank you. Mr. Black, same question. Well, again, we're way apart on that. I, like I say, I've got, I'm in recovery. I've been clean and sober for 25 years. I know how I did it. And I've helped a lot of people get uh, clean and sober over the years. And as a defense attorney, when I get these DUIs, once I address the legal issues, I get these people help and in treatment. The problem is, is the structure. If you want to keep, they, if you can keep somebody clean and sober for a year, the chances of them going back out are very little, very little. And that's what, that's, and it's just a matter of structure. And I'm willing to give that structure at no cost. I mean, it's not going to be something I need to dream up and talk to the commissioners about, oh, I need all this money. That's not the case here. I know what these folks need to get them clean and sober. I mean, some of these have people have never been sober for a year, ever, from the time they were 11 or 12. You're going to give them a first time of a year so that they can say, well, gosh, I've never even experienced this before. Thank you. Uh, rebuttal, Mr. Roar. All right, thank you. I, I guess all I'm going to say is that, it, that, actually, maybe I misunderstood that question because I thought it was about drugs, and usually when people say drugs, they mean drugs not including alcohol. I think they're incorrect on that, but, you know, that's just how people say it, drugs and alcohol. So uh, we, we can deal with alcohol because that's within the jurisdiction of the court, but drugs, as I understand them, like heroin and methamphetamine, are not something we really address in district court. That's more something we address at Superior Court, where I'm the drug court judge. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Um, this is for both of you. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? Mm -hmm. Roar let on. So, Mr. Black, you're first. Yes, I have. I, I'm surprised that this came up. But uh, 30 years ago, yes, I was involved drugs and alcohol. And I had a judge hold me accountable for it. And I, was, and I was held accountable for it. And I've been clean and sober ever since. And that judge knows that I became a lawyer. I had to discuss it extensively with the uh, Character and Fitness Committee, as well as with the Supreme Court, who allowed me to become a lawyer. So I talked to two, several judges on this and lawyers, and they said, don't even bring it up, John. It's too old. And I think we've, been, I think we've seen that already, what, that this is just a uh, smear of some sort. So, but that's what it is. I mean, it's behind me. Am I proud of it? No. But, it, but it, do I use it? Yes. I speak at prisons. I go to prisons all the time. I spoke at his drug court and told my story. Of course, he wasn't the judge then. It was Ken Williams who really was the judge that got that going. And I told my story there. So it's been no secret, believe me. And I like to go to prisons because it, it inspires them that they can do something with their life. Mr. Roy? Thank you. Uh, well, no, I, I've never been charged, nor convicted, nor held in any way by any federal or state authorities. I don't have any felony convictions whatsoever. I don't have any DUI convictions in this state or in any other state. I don't have any domestic violent assault convictions. Um, I've never been uh, any sort of, there's never been any sort of civil forfeiture with respect to me. So it would be a complete no for me. Rebuttal, Mr. Black? Mr. Roy? All right, and at this time, I'd like to ask if any of the representatives from the media have any questions that they'd like to ask. Ken? Ken Leverett, Fourth Broadcasting. Uh, being, being off top of a judge is, is overseeing justice in your courtroom. Uh, would you like go ahead and uh, tell us how you your means you use to do that, both for deported defendants and the uh, accused and, uh, and the, uh, the the county? Okay, so let's see, Mr. Roar, uh, you're up first. Well, I think that's a great question. I mean, I think that's what the whole thing's about is, is justice. And, uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a good. Uh, 
answer. I think what I would say is a little kind of in reverse. It's a little like you know obscenity. You know it when you see it. Uh, I, I know justice. I think we all know it. I know when I don't see it. But I think it comes from people who care about what they do and who really put some time and effort into it. That's that's what I try to do. Uh, I, I try to do the best I can possibly do in every situation. When I'm when I'm doing court, I always put myself. I mean, I think I've got some kind of. I'm not sure what it is. Some sort of a defect on my part, but I try to put myself in the place of the other person and think about how I would feel if I was that person. I do that with every single person, the defendant, the prosecutor, everybody in the courtroom, the clerk, the janitor, and uh, that's just how I live my life. But what I do is I try to be fair everywhere, not just in court. I think it's a, sort of a habitual thing. I try to be fair and reasonable at every turn, and I, I use that in court all the time. Thank you. Mr. Black, same question. Thank you. Well, I look at the judicial position as a, like an umpire. I mean, calling the balls and strikes. Uh, you have the final say. You don't have to go along with the, with the recommendation of the lawyers. You can, you can step out. My hat's off to uh, Judge Doherty. I remember he had a case of a, an assault 4 DB or that, and it involved a gun. And the agreement went between the lawyers was like three days in jail. He, gave, he put this guy in jail for a year, and rightly so. I mean, the guy had popped a gun off in the in the dispute. So my idea is to do more of that and get, instead of going soft and slow with these people, I'm going to go hard and fast. If it's talking about, if, if these people are first-time offenders, that's one thing. But these constant people that are coming in. And let me tell you about, even, he's saying there's no heroin and meth out here. If you get caught with a needle or a little baggie of meth or heroin, you get charged in district court here, so I so I would have you under that th under my thumb if that was the case. Believe me. Thank you, Rebuttal? All right, um, I'm I'm not entirely sure about the the baggy part of this. Uh, if anybody's really going to be prosecuted, it's gotten to the point where basically it's almost like heroin's the new marijuana. I hate to say, I mean, it pains me to say it, but it's, uh, it, it's, I don't think the cops even arrest people when they see somebody with a needle. Uh, so, should they? I don't know, I'm not in law enforcement, but realistically, I, 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 if, the, if the whole thing's gonna be on the backs of uh, district court baby cases, I think it's not gonna be very successful. Thank you, Mr. Black, rebuttal? Well, uh, show he doesn't know really what's going on out here because I do get cases of uh, possession of paraphernalia. And even though there are small amounts of drugs, I mean, those are the people. If it's larger amounts of drugs, then yeah, they get charged as a felony or if it's an op man. I'm a defense attorney. That's what I do. I'm not just sitting up on the bench at those points. I've been to s several counties. I've done trials in several counties. I know what, it, what, what the judges are supposed to be doing up there. There's no, that's no mystery. I'm going to go hard and fast with this community and get some stuff done out here, not thank just you. the same old stuff. All right, thank you both. So it's time to wrap up this panel. Oh, did we have one more media question? Yeah, another one. And what about uh, Christy? Christy, did you have anything? Okay. okay, so we'll go ahead and wrap up and move to our candidates' two minute closing statements. And we'll reverse the order this time from the opening statements and begin with. John Black. Well, but, you know, I, I've come to understand that a lot of these defendants are that because of my background. And, you know, I'll get a guy in on a DUI or something like that, or a drug case or whatever, and, I'll, and it'll come down to after we see that there's not the legal issues that he can go to trial, I say, well, do you want to, he's uh, confronted with the question, do you want to go to jail? or do you want to go to treatment? Now, you'd be real surprised how many people say, well, how much jail are we talking about? Now, I'll bet you there's not one of us in here that would ask that question, how much jail are we talking about here? None of us. So, <coughs> jail is a terrific hammer to get these people to react. If they don't want to go to treatment, then they can go to jail. If they finally, after they've had enough jail, they want to go to treatment, that's, that's when we don't want to deal with them. So, for them to say that, I mean, I think the community, by 
my involvement with the community, and especially walk, talking to the community, house after house after house for weeks and weeks, that's what they're telling me, that they've got a drug dealer living next door. There's people going in there all hours of the night. They want something done with that. They get, a, they get their car prowled, tell the police, the guy gets arrested, and the next day he's out of jail prowling the other neighbor's car. And that's not going to happen. I mean, why do you think he's prowling the car? He's looking for money to buy drugs. It's, that's the root of the problem. That's what I want to address. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, um, I think just a moment ago, my, my opponent, who, who is a defense attorney, by the way, was suggesting that I'm the one that's soft on crime, which is seems really peculiar to me. I think it was soft and slow. He's hard and fast. I'm soft and slow is kind of what he's trying to say here. Can you work this out on the long drive out here? Well, um, you know, he didn't have a history of sentencing anybody because although he says he has, whatever it is, 17 years as a judge and a lawyer, he really has no experience at all as a judge. So he can't refer to the things he's done as a, as a sentencing judge. But if you read the, the Peninsula Daily News, uh, they had an article just, I think it was in the Sunday paper, why just a couple of days ago, about a judge named Eric Rohr, the, the presiding judge of the Superior Court, who sentenced a guy who burned down somebody's house out in Beaver, terrorized this woman, uh, basically, I mean, I don't know, check it out, Google it, I'm not going to say his name, but, but he, then he did, thought it would be clever to send this nasty letter to her, and sort of this psychological terror program. Domestic violence is serious, domestic violence is real. He, he sends this thing, I gave him, I exceeded the, pro the defense attorney requested, I think it was 47 months, I gave him nearly 10 years additional, even though the victim never received the letter. I mean, I'm dead serious about that type of thing. This isn't just about uh, you know, his, his apparent attempt to kind of project his, his own recovery efforts on everyone else. There's more to district court than that. Uh, I'm concerned about the budget of district court. I hate to sound like a penny pincher, but we're up, they have this thing, we all call them fines, they call them LFOs. We're not able to collect the money from indigent people that we once were. If anybody is on social security or receives any needs-based funding like, a, like food stamps, we can't collect money from them. This is going to cause looking at those commissioner candidates, this is going to cause some serious problems for us. So we're, we're going to need to look at that part of this, too. There's more to this than, than we're, we talked about. All right, thank you again. So let's give a round of applause for these two candidates. And on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Plum County, thank you for appearing here tonight. I hope you can remain after for the rest after the forum and visit with audience members afterwards who may have some lingering questions and with that we will move into the second portion of tonight's forum